I'm David Fitzpatrick. I'm the scientific director and the CEO of the Max Planck Florida Institute for Neuroscience. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the third and the final presentation in our 2016 Science Meets Music lecture series. Now, as those of you who have become members of the Max Planck family know, we're very proud of this series because it helps people to understand the transformative science that's going on in the Max Planck Society and in the Institute just down the road here in Jupiter. And the series also helps to emphasize that science and the arts, which are often viewed as two really different worlds, are really not so different. In fact, the passion, the creativity, the dedication, the discipline, the attention to detail that makes an outstanding artist are the same qualities that make an outstanding scientist. Now, as I look around the room, I realize there are a number of new faces in the audience tonight, and let me take a moment to thank you for braving the weather, and thank you for braving I-95 uh, to be with us tonight. I understand it's really a mess uh, out there. Um, but this time we had over 500 people register for this event. They all couldn't come, that's very clear. Uh, but this was really uh, a record for our series. And it's made possible by our partnership with the Benjamin School and its head, Bob Goldberg. Uh, and by the way, if this is your first time in here, and even if it isn't your first time, isn't this an amazing place? Really, really, really. Uh, so, so we thank all of our loyal supporters, especially those of you who are uh, members of the Brain Trust. I know you've all been sitting there and perhaps you looked up at uh, the screens and noticed uh, the description of the Brain Trust. And for those of you who would like to learn, learn more about the Brain Trust, um, please see uh, uh, Marie, who will be just outside the door here and she'll be happy to talk to you about that. Um, now, as I noticed there are new faces here, I bet some of you are asking, what is this Max Planck thing anyway? Thank you for asking that question. Um, so the Max Planck Society is Germany's most successful scientific organization. 18 Nobel laureates, 3,300 inventions, 83 separate institutes, and how many are located outside Europe? One, just one, that's the Max Planck Florida Institute. Now, all these institutes are united by the passion for generating new knowledge, developing new technologies, and applying these technologies to open the door to insights that are the foundation for addressing a host of challenges that face mankind. Each institute has its own scientific focus, and our institute's focused on the biology of the brain, understanding the structure, function, and development of brain circuits that are responsible for our senses, our actions, our thoughts, our emotions, and of course, our memories. Generating the knowledge base that holds the key to new diagnostics, therapies, and cures for the long list of neurological and psychiatric disorders that have such a devastating impact on our lives. Now, the good news is that this has been an amazing year for the Institute. We had almost $13 million in grant support from the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Ryo Yasuda, who is scientific director and head of our neuronal signal transduction group, received the prestigious NIH Director's Pioneer Award. This is given to a total of 13 scientists in the country. Now you know how many biomedical scientists there are in the US? Thousands. So uh, to have one of these uh, is really a mark of distinction. Um, this is $4.8 million for him to pursue high risk cutting edge research into the molecular basis of memory formation. Riohe, will you stand up for some applause, please?
Now, I, I want you to understand that only two scientists in Florida received this award, and the other is at Scripps, Florida. His name is Matt Disney. Now, in case you haven't caught on, we are really putting Jupiter life sciences on the map of scientific discovery. And we thank this community for your continued support. But it's not all about scientific discovery. It's also about training the next generation of scientists. And of the first this past year has been the creation of the International Max Planck Research School for Brain and Behavior. And you saw some signs come up on that as well. Uh, we launched this with the Max Planck Institute in Bonn, Germany, uh, Bonn University, and our good colleagues at the Florida Atlantic University. We had over 200 applicants for this program in its first year, which was, which was remarkable. And I can tell you we're attracting some exceptional students to the program who know the amazing opportunities they have for training within the Max Planck environment. This is in addition to the training programs that we have for undergraduates that are FAU, our outreach programs, our summer internships for high school students and for teachers, um, and of course our annual Brain Bee competition. By the way, Bob, do you notice who won the Brain Bee competition this year? That's, that's right, so, uh, students from the, the Benjamin School here took first place in the, in the Brain Bee competition. Now, if it wasn't for our partnership with the Benjamin School and the access to this phenomenal venue, we wouldn't be able to offer this series uh, to uh, so many members of this community. And we're extremely thankful. And before we begin, I'd like to call Bob Goldberg up, head of Benjamin School, to say a few words. Bob? Wow, thank you, David, so much. Uh, I really would never have been able to explain how thrilling it is for us at the Benjamin School to have forged this partnership uh, with Max Planck Institute. And listening up to David speak about the good work, the excellent work, the unique work, the extraordinary science that takes place at that institute, and to think that we live just down the street here at the Benjamin School from all of that, really puts us in a very advantageous position to partner with a real symbiosis to our relationship, which is to say that we really have a very shared partnership. We're delighted to open up this theater, this performing arts center to all of you, to not only to come and to be exposed and enriched by what this kind of an evening can provide, uh, but also to be our guest, to come into the Benjamin School and know a little bit about us, see a little bit about us, and know that you've been here when our name is mentioned out in the community. Uh, you know, my uh, personally speaking, uh, my parents, uh, uh, both passed away within the last few years, and one was 89 and one was uh, 91. And they both suffered for several years with Alzheimer's, with the effects of Alzheimer's, with dementia. And as their child, and you know what it's like to grow up, you're always the child of your parents, no matter how old you get. It was very painful to watch them go through those last stages of life that were hardly the golden years for them. And when I learned that that topic would be discussed today, I thought, well, how wonderful, how wonderful for me personally to listen to the kind of science that someday will be able to assist folks like my parents who had such a difficult end of life experience. Uh, we are just thrilled, I have to tell you, we're absolutely thrilled here to live in the community and to be chosen as a partner uh, with Max Planck. So we couldn't be more delighted to invite you all into a theater that is just celebrating its first birthday, by the way. We opened last March. Uh, it's, it's become emblematic of the Benjamin School. Thank you. This building has become emblematic of the Benjamin School in that we really feel over the past 
10 years, we've arrived on the national stage here at Benjamin. So we have a metaphor. Uh, all over the country, the best colleges and universities, the most recognized and prestigious, know who we are. And they rush here every year to be one of 200 schools, each of them, uh, scurry in before the door closes to come and meet our parents and meet our students at our fall uh, college, college conference, uh, college open house. So uh, we really feel that we are uh, rightfully placed here in Jupiter where everything is now happening and very thrilled and very appreciative to have become partners and friends with Max Planck Institute. So thank you all for visiting us and thank you, David, for your kind words about us. Now, in addition to the Benjamin School, uh, we owe a, a debt of gratitude to the Florida Atlantic University and to President John Kelly for all they've done and continue to do to support the development of neuroscience research on the Jupiter campus. Many of you may know that a new FAU Brain Institute has been formed that will be centered on the Jupiter campus, and the university has received $4.5 million from the state of Florida to begin building this exciting new initiative. And I can tell you, there's an enormous opportunity for collaboration and synergy between the faculty that will be recruited to FAU and the Max Planck Florida Institute and the Scripps Institute. Now, tonight, Florida Atlantic University is contributing um, to our program through the talented students in the Department of Music who are members of the Florida Atlantic University Woodwind Quintet. And here to introduce them in the first musical performance is Dr. Kyle Prescott, who is director of bands at Florida Atlantic University. Kyle? Thank you. What a wonderful evening. Thank you all for being here in this lovely facility. Just tremendous. My first time in this theater, I will say. It took me a few minutes to get my jaw, get my jaw completely closed. It's really quite spectacular. So bravo to you for building such a wonderful place. And bravo to the Max Planck Institute for putting on such a mindful idea as science meets music. I thought that the words expressed a few moments ago were spot on in terms of how music is about detail and taking care of all these things in a, in a combined way, the same way that the sciences are in many ways. There are a number of books and, and certainly a, a fair amount of uh, propaganda out there about music and science and how the things work together. And some of it's really quite inspiring and true. I will say this, that uh, often as we look at public education today, and in, including in the university, we treat our students as receivers of information on very narrow streams. And we give them bits of information about this and that and the other thing, and then we give them a degree and hope they can put it all together. Well, the students on stage have taken coursework in music theory and music history and ear training and how to play scales and how to do this and that, and all these very specific things that have to do with music. And what you're going to hear in a few moments is what can happen when you take the various disparate elements of any discipline, put them all together into a human being, and let them truly synthesize. So this is, um, this is what happens when synth synthesis meets art. And I hope that you enjoy this fabulous performance. Um, I want to tell you about the players just a little bit. They are all music majors from the Department of Music at FAU. Um, the Department of Music is housed in the College of Arts and Letters at FAU, the Dorothy F. Schmidt College of Arts and Letters, where we are led by our intrepid dean, Dr. Heather Coltman. Heather is actually with us tonight. Heather, where are you? There we are. Uh, the players themselves work together, and when they are on stage in a quintet, they are equal. They are five absolutely equal partners. Um, there's no one who leads the rehearsal. They all jump in and say things when things need to be fixed. Um, occasionally, those of us who are professors come by and pretend we're leading, but that's just because they pay us to do that. Um, Uh-oh, my boss is right there. The reality is the musicians are really quite self-motivated. And those musicians are on the flute, Miriam Bendowd, who is a performance major on the flute. She's in her third year at FAU. On the clarinet, we have a master's student. That's right, a third year undergraduate and a master's student in the same organization, treating each other as equals. Um, Alex Petrov, who comes to us from the great country of Macedonia. On oboe, Fareed Blanchard, who comes to us from the great country of Miramar, Florida. <laughs> Fareed's a fabulous oboe uh, performance major also. Um, and on the horn, 
Michael Holland, also a master's student coming to us from, Mar from Maryland to Florida. And uh, I've left one out. Uh, on the bassoon, Patrick Montanari, who comes to us from regionally in Boynton Beach, also a, a commercial music major and an undergraduate studying to be a, uh, an engineer in, a, in one of those giant recording um, bu buildings someday. So with that, I give you the combined forces, one organization, the FAU Woodwind Quintet. Say, may I say, bravo, bravo. <laughs> and are we, uh, 
We have been uh, collaborating with uh, FAU uh, for a number of years scientifically, uh, but I hope we can continue to collaborate in our lecture series and whatnot. That was really, really wonderful. Now, it was 1906 in Munich, Germany, that psychiatrist Aloise Alzheimer's made the remarkable discovery that his patient who had died with dementia, had specific changes in the structure of her brain involving the presence of amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles, abnormalities that are now recognized as hallmarks of the devastating disorder that has become known as Alzheimer's disease. I'm really confident that almost everyone in this room has been touched by this disease has seen or experienced the toll that this disorder takes on a person's life and on the lives of the loved ones that care for them. So let me just put some numbers on this. These numbers are staggering. It's estimated that as many as 5.1 million Americans have Alzheimer's disease. And worldwide, nearly 44 million people have Alzheimer's disease or related dementia. <clears throat> Without a cure, more than 16 million Americans are expected to have the disease by 2050. The cost of caring for Alzheimer's patients in the US is estimated to be 226 billion this year, and by 2050, it could rise as high as $1.1 trillion. The global cost of Alzheimer's and dementia is estimated to be 605 billion, which is the equivalent to 1% of the entire world's gross domestic product. Now, what can we do about this? A number of scientists in the Max Planck Society, including those here in Jupiter, are addressing fundamental questions about the biology of the brain and the mechanisms that create and store memories so that we can better understand what's happening in memory disorders like Alzheimer's. Tonight, all the way from a Max Planck Institute in Bonn, Germany, we have with us two of the world's leading experts in the field of dementia research. Dr. Eva Mendelkau and Dr. Eckhart Mendelkau, a husband and wife team maybe I should have said a wife and husband team, sorry, Eva, <laughs> whose scientific accomplishments have earned them international recognition and awards from organizations such as the American Academy of Neurology uh, and the United States Alzheimer's Association. The Mandelkows are responsible for pioneering work on the function of a protein called tau, that's T-A-U, and I guarantee you're going to hear more about that. Uh, and this turns out to be the basic substance that makes up those tangles that Alzheimer discovered so many years ago. So tonight, Ava will take the microphone to provide us with an overview of her groundbreaking, uh, of their groundbreaking research, my apologies. Um, just some background on Ava. Uh, she studied medicine and worked for several years as a physician in the clinic before shifting her focus to basic research. She earned her doctorate uh, at the Max Planck Institute for Medical Research in Heidelberg, um, where she and Eckhart uh, first met and developed uh, more than a scientific collaboration, may I say. Um, subsequently, she uh, carried out research at Brandeis, um, at Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla, uh, at the MRC lab uh, in Cambridge, uh, where she really began to focus on proteins of the cytoskeleton. This is the structure that allows cells to maintain their shape and their organization, and it's especially elaborate in neurons that have these amazing dendritic and axonal processes that it can extend for long distances. Now, one of these proteins was tau, a protein that for a long time was not recognized as playing a role in Alzheimer's disease. Focus on plaques, plaques, plaques and Tao didn't get attention. But Ava and Eckert were driven by their interest in understanding the role that this protein plays in nerve cell function, 
They weren't thinking about Alzheimer's per se. They just wanted to know what does this protein do? And being together at the Max Planck Unit for Structural Biology in Hamburg, in the kind of environment that invests in scientists and encourages curiosity-driven research, they were able to pursue novel approaches to understanding this protein's role in the brain that turns out to have direct relevance for Alzheimer's disease. It is really a great pleasure and a privilege to hand over the podium to Eva so she can tell you more about this couple's amazing research into Alzheimer's disease. Eva? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is a great honor for me to speak here on this event, Science Meets, uh, <coughs> Science Meets Music. And uh, this is organized by the Max Planck uh, Florida Institute. And I would like to thank uh, David Fitzpatrick and his team for inviting me. <coughs> The title of my talk is uh, Alzheimer's disease, uh, and I would like to first give a review on the features of Alzheimer's disease, the research efforts on the causes of the disease, and then I would like to come to some very promising therapeutic approaches. Alzheimer's disease, as you all know, is a brain disease. It affects uh, um, people at advanced age, uh, it is uh, noticed by a gradual loss of memory, and that means loss of brain tissue, loss of nerve cells, and it is characterized by a clumping of two proteins in the brain, the amyloid beta protein in amyloid plaques and the tau protein in neurofibular tangles. And these features have been first noticed by Alice Alzheimer about 100 years ago um, <clears throat> when he actually treated his, his first, the first Alzheimer patient, the Augusta Data, and uh, after her death, actually, she looked in, he looked into the brain and he saw these abnormal protein deposits. And one of the famous uh, sentences of Augusta Data was, ich habe mich sozusagen verlassen, I have lost myself, so to speak. No, at that time, Alzheimer's disease was a rare disease because the average life expectancy was about 45 years old. But in the meantime, the advantages of modern medicine have um, <clears throat> led to a dramatic increase of life expectancy um, for up to over 75 years. Uh, in developed countries, and so this means that the incidence of Alzheimer's has uh, increased tremendously. Uh, here you have a map um, of uh, 2010, where you see the countries uh, of, let me see here. Yeah. Yeah, well, you see the countries here in blue in Europe that have over 20% of uh, people that are older than 65 years. And we expect in 2050, we expect actually that most of the countries in the world will have then 20% uh, or more of the people over 65 years. And that means in America, 40 million Alzheimer patients, well, I think uh, you, <laughs> David said, 60 millions. We don't know exactly uh, the millions. But it tells us actually what the major global health problem lies ahead of us. And that means not only burden on the, on the, on the families, but also a burden, of course, um, financial burden on the health systems of all these different countries. And a very sm small fraction of the Alzheimer patient um, uh, have, <clears throat> have mutations in certain genes and that can get inherited and they cause the familiar Alzheimer's disease. The last majority of Alzheimer patients um, have the sporadic form. 
but these familiar cases are very important for us because they allowed us to uh, <coughs> generate uh, cell and animal models and to actually uh, elucidate some of the key questions of the pathology of Alzheimer's disease. And you know, brain diseases they can have many clinical manifestations depending on what region of the brain they are uh, taking place. And uh, Alzheimer's disease, for instance, is actually uh, <clears throat> the pathology of Alzheimer's disease is actually uh, <clears throat> affecting the hippocampus of the, the brain. And that is the structure you see here in uh, color. And the hippocampus is actually the organ that uh, is <clears throat> store, storing the information uh, and uh, has, uh, gets the retrieval of the information. And so uh, it is actually the CPU of our uh, brain, the, 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 this uh, um, central processing unit. And so we can understand now why when uh, the hippocampus is damaged, then we have this strong uh, memory decline. And here you see, for instance, a brain um, of a 70-year-old uh, person. Um, it's a normal person. And here you see an Alzheimer brain. And uh, the main feature is the loss of brain tissue, the loss of neurons, the loss of synapses. And the new anatomists, Heiko and Eva Brack in Frankfurt, in Germany, they found about 20 years ago, when they looked at brain sections uh, of uh, people, they, look, they found that the Alzheimer pathology spreads in a very characteristic fashion through the brain. And, these, uh, and they uh, found uh, then these six Brack stages. And the important point here is that the clinical manifestation of the uh, stage one and two is, uh, this, uh, is completely silent. But we have mild cognitive impairment at stage three and four, and we have severe pathology and dementia um, at stage five and six. And now we cannot look into the brain of a living person, you know, in the brain tissue, we cannot look in it. But there was this break, this huge breakthrough of uh, Chet Mattis and Bill Klunk in Pittsburgh um, recently, you know, five, five six years ago, uh, because they developed methods to, uh, <clears throat> to um, detect the, br the aggregates in the, br in the brain and by non-invasive imaging. And they found a substance that binds to the amyloid plaques and they could then um, image them by PET uh, positron um, emission uh, tomatography. And here is now some examples of these, this method, and that comes from the, 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 the Harvard lab, um, Kate Johnson's uh, from the, uh, from in Harvard. And here you see, for instance, normal people, they have very little amyloid plugs and very little tau in the brain. Now, in the middle, you see, again, normal people, they have quite a bit of amyloid already in the brain and also of tau, but they are still cognitively normal. And then you have here, at, in the right, you have then the severe pathology, a uh, lot of amyloid and a lot of tau protein, and this, are the, uh, brain, uh, this is the brain of an Alzheimer patient, and he is completely demented. So, with other words, 10 to 15 years, long, we have a phase of pathological aggregation before memory deficits uh, sets in. And so it's actually very important, uh, knowing this, that we have to start, uh, ideally, uh, with a th therapy if we want to prevent the uh, disease uh, before the cognitive decline really sets massively in. Now let's look at the protein aggregates in the brain that um, do these uh, terrible uh, things. There are here, you see uh, here, the roundish structures are the amyloid plaques consisting of, a, uh, of the amyloid 
protein, and you see here these dark structures are the neurofibrillar tangles consisting of tau. And both these proteins uh, uh, generate long uh, abnormal fibers seen here by electron microscopy. And both proteins have different functions in the brain. Like, for instance, um, in the case of a, a beta pr protein here, uh, we are actually dealing with a membrane protein, the amyloid precursor protein, that sits here in the membrane, and then some proteases come that cut out of the middle of the protein, this membrane protein, cut this little piece here. This is the beta protein. And that then assembles into amyloid fibers, sort of plugs, and, um, and here, we are dealing there with an abnormal cleavage of this membrane protein. And in the case of tau protein, it's, we're dealing with a cytoplasmic protein inside the cell, and it's actually binding to the microtubules inside the cell that are the tracks for transport, and they stabilize the microtubules. And then in Alzheimer's disease, the, this tau gets modified by so-called phosphorylation, detaches from the microtubules, the microtubules fall apart, the tracks, and then this tau protein aggregates in these new, these particle filaments, or, and then into this new fibrillar uh, tangles. And here we are dealing with an abnormal modification of tau with uh, phosphorylation. Now, the aim of Alzheimer's disease is analysis of pathological processes, development of methods for early detection, and development of uh, therapeutic strategies. And to achieve these goals, we have to study the pathological um, processes in appropriate uh, model systems that have some similarity with humans in in the case of genes and, and proteins. And the most um, important uh, m animal models are actually uh, flies, flies, um, zebrafish, mice, and worms, and we are working on mice and worms. Let me now come to the cell biology and the pathology of the tau protein, and this is actually our uh, research area. Here I'm showing you how nerve cells uh, talk to each other. We have here uh, cell bodies, we have here the long axons, and then the small dendrites here, and then an electrical signal is actually generated here, um, and this is then transported along the axon and meets here the dendrites of another cell at the junctions, the so-called synapses, and then this cells, uh, cell generates another electrical signal, and that moves on here and propagates to other cells. So this communication of the neurons in, in Alzheimer's is um, disturbed. Here you see a model of such a uh, synapse, this junction between the two neurons. You have here the, the presynapse, and an electrical signal is coming up here, and then there are cascades of reactions and so on that leads to this uh, uh, release of, of uh, all kinds of various chemicals, of ions, of neurotransmitters, and so on. And these chemical signals are taken up here by the postsynapse, and that then the signal goes on to other parts of this receiving cell. And this communication across the, the synapse of these two uh, proteins that is actually disturbed in Alzheimer's disease. Like, for instance, this chemical communication, like, for instance, some neurotransmitters like acetyl acetylcholine is too low, then other neurotransmitters like glutamate, they are too high, and then we have the damage of the synapses by this pathological abeta uh, protein, and then also we have disruption of the signaling by tau protein. Now, it is very difficult for a cell to maintain a healthy axon. And here, I'm illustrating you the problem. You have here the cell body, and you have here the axon terminal forming the synapse. And in between, you have this long, thin uh, axon, can up, be up to one meter long. And this no, this cell body has to 
actually here nourish the synapse. So the axon has to actually nourish here the synapse and has to bring back all the debris back to the cell body. And so this axon needs an eff a very strong and efficient transport system and has a lot of special proteins and, and uh, needs chemical energy to do this. And the uh, this, uh, transport system is made up of the microtubules and of the tau protein. And now let's look at the transport system in um, detail. Uh, here you see again a neuron, an axon, and here the terminal forming the synapse then. And inside the axon, you see here the microtubules as the tracks for transport. And the tracks need stabilization by the tau here. These, the tau is a tie. And then you have these engines, these motor proteins run up and down the microtubule and carry their cargo. So I can visualize this uh, transport in axons uh, by uh, light microscopy. And what you see here is mitochondria. This is the power station of the cell uh, that move back and forth here in the axons and try to uh, distribute an e the, the energy in an even way. But this is a very similar experiment, but this time uh, the mitochondria are here in red, and we have now here introduced a large amount of tau in blue. And as you can see, we lost most of the mitochondria, and these mitochondria cannot move. That means if you have too much tau on the microtubule tracks, then we have transport inhibition. And as we know, all the uh, atomic structures of um, these compounds, we can make a model, and that is seen here. And here you see uh, the, the surface of the microtubule. Here is the tau protein, and here is then the motor protein kinesin we solved some time ago, and uh, the structure of it. And uh, you can see that the kinesin can only here attach actually to the microtubule surface when there is no tau, because the tau protein and the kinesin motor compete for the same binding site on, on the um, microtubule surface. And so you can imagine if you have now a lot of taus there, as I showed you a moment in the axon, then of course you have transport inhibition. And from experience, experiments like this, we can actually then, uh, <coughs> actually then uh, get pathways of tau toxicity and here, for instance, in the normal situation, you have a microtubule and a few um, uh, tau protein, these ties uh, stabilizing the microtubule, and then the motor proteins can run up and down the free surface of the microtubule and carry their cargo. But if you have too much tau protein, then it is covering the surface of the microtubule like obstacles, and the motor proteins have a hard time to attach. And the consequence of this is transport inhibition. Then the cell senses this, and this is what's taking place partly in Alzheimer's disease, and then phosphorylates, modifies this tau protein in a way that it detaches from the microtubules, and then the microtubules get labeled and partly fall apart. So again, you have transport inhibition, but this time because we lost part of the tracks. And then this phosphorylated tau accumulates and first form, forms these oligomeric structures and then these neurofibular tangles, and in our Hence, this is the most toxic process, as I will show you in a moment. Let me now come to the animal models of tau pathology and the development of therapeutic approaches. We screened 200,000 compounds and found a few very interesting aggregation inhibitors. Some of those are seen here. And then we made a model, a worm model, and where we actually expressed in the worms the, in the neurons of the worms, the aggregated tau. And the, the results you see here, this is a normal worm. It has this nice, vivid uh, thrashes. And this is now a worm that has these tau aggregates in its neurons. And you see, it's paralyzed. It cannot move. Now we can take this paralyzed worm here and then incubate it with some of our tau aggregation inhibitors. And what you see is the worms can move again. So they have, they, they, they have you know, uh, <clears throat> recovered. 
And when you look into the neurons of the worm, what we could do by biochemistry, then you see that these aggregates of the tau uh, are gone. Now, to work with worms is very cheap, is very fast. It, uh, the drugs can penetrate rapidly. There is no blood-brain barrier like with mice or with humans. And cells and genes are well, well, are well characterized. But let's now come to the transgenic mice, which we, we generated a lot of those, and we actually uh, <clears throat> expressed um, in the mice uh, two, three features. First of all, we made mice that either um, expressed a protein, uh, that a tau mutant protein, that aggregates very strongly, and we call it pro-aggregant. And then we also expressed a mutant of tau that cannot aggregate at all. We designed it this way, and we call it anti-aggregant. And then we actually uh, linked with the expression of tau uh, by luminescent reporter. So we can actually observe then in live animals uh, the expression of tau by bioluminescence long before the cognitive decline sets in. And the third feature is that uh, we can switch on and we can switch off the tau so the the, the, this uh, transgenic mice are regulatable, and we can this way observe the onset of disease, and we can um, observe the recovery from disease. And here you see, for instance, 14-day-old mice, and you see here they have nice bioluminescent signals in, the, in their brain. These are live mice, just a little bit anesthetized, and so on. And these signals actually tell us that they're in, in about 10 uh, uh, months they will uh, be demented. And now let's look at the sections, the brain sections of a mouse that uh, expresses this pro aggregant tau, and you see after three months of expression of this mutant, we have already this robust um, aggregates of the neurofibular tangles, the tau aggregates. And so we know that about 10 months, this mouse will have strong cognitive decline. And then here, this, um, this other mouse that expresses a tau that cannot aggregate even after 22 months, you know, there is no aggregates. This mouse uh, will never get uh, aggregates and it will never get a cognitive decline. So, with other words, the memory deficits are tightly coupled to the aggregation of tau. Then we look at the neurons of um, the part of the, of the, in the dental gyrus, a part of the hippocampus. I show, show, told you it is the CPU of our brain and so on. And there you see in the pro again case, um, we see here a, a loss of neurons after five months of expression and the dental gyrus of the hippocampus is more or less gone. The neuron, the, there are no neurons left really. Whilst here in the anti aggregate case, um, they are just age-related changes, but there are no neuronal loss. And let's now test these mice uh, for learning and memory. And one does it in a way that one has this pool of milky water, and then the mice have to learn the position of a platform, but they cannot see the platform because the, the surface the, the, is milky and so on. And you see the mice, mouse cats trained for some time, here four days, and this is a fourth trial, and you see it can in about 15, 16 seconds uh, learn the position of the platform. But now let's look at our mice, mouse, this pro mouse with all these aggregates of tau in the brain. Now, it has been actually trained one day longer, five days, and then the third trial. And as you can see, it has these aggregates of tau in the brain, it has uh, synapse loss, it has neuronal loss, it has hyperphosphorylation of tau, it has uh, inflammation, it has all the signs that you find normally in the Alzheimer brain. And as you can see, it has a hard time to remember uh, the position of the platform here. And we didn't only test this one mouse, but we tested uh, 13 other mice with it, and they all show the same behavior. And this is actually the only mouse that, as, I, as you will see in a moment, just by chance 
will actually find the platform. The rest of the mice will not find the platform, and after one and a half minutes, we try to rescue them because they, they, they panic, if they, because they're not made for swimming. So now, the question is, the key question is, can we rescue the memory uh, of this mouse if it has been um, lost? And the answer is, yes, we can. Because these mice are... <laughs> now, because these mice are regulatable, this is a genetic trick. We cannot do it with people, because... Yeah, sorry. But <laughs> now you see here the same mouse, 433, 2333. And you see, in about 10 seconds, it uh, finds, it remembers the platform. And, and then there was this young student in our lab, and he said, ah, oh, the neurons come back, the neurons come back. And I said, no, the neurons will not come back. But we looked into the brain and analyzed it. The synapses come back. That is this um, junction between these two um, neurons where memory is, is, is stored. And so you see here, you know, before, um, the switch off of the toxic tau for four weeks. Uh, we have here uh, lost a lot of neurons and they come back, back afterwards. So the, 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 the trick is the switch off of the toxic tau. Now what we learn from this, uh, first we learn uh, that memory can be restored if we can get rid of misfolded toxic tau. And secondly, memory covers because synapses grow back. And now, to find a cure for Alzheimer's, and we all know it's very, very important, we have to engage and we have to invest in basic research so we can actually find compounds that dissolve uh, the, the aggregates in our brain and they go, and that is our problem at the moment, they penetrate through the blood-brain barrier and we are working on it very intensively. Let me now come to the end, uh, finally, to a few um, treatments, um, especially, uh, first of all, I have to say, there is no treatment to cure Alzheimer's so far. The available drugs can retard the progression of Alzheimer's for a very uh, minimal amount of time, I would say. Some even don't do it, although the companies say, yes, they help. <laughs> but. Uh, and these uh, drugs can all not reverse or, reverse or cure. Uh, however, there are some very promising developments in therapy, and one of them is actually the antibody-based therapy I will come to in a moment. And the current approaches are actually aimed at four categories, neurotransmitters, a beta protein, tau protein, and some other targets. And the Dark drugs that are at the moment approved are actually uh, those that belong to the first, um, the first category, uh, the neurotransmitters. And, uh, <clears throat> and the, the aim of these drugs is actually to restore neurotransmitters at the physiological level uh, that is actually perturbed in Alzheimer's disease. And for instance, when we look at acetyl, Choline, uh, then we can actually, um, it's strongly reduced in Alzheimer's disease, and we can by using, oh, sorry. So, um, sorry. Uh, so, by using uh, acetylcholine esterase inhibitors or by using acetylcholine receptor uh, antagonists here and here and so on, we can actually increase the acetylcholine, this neurotransmitter, and we can boost the cholinergic system. And that helps to some, in some way. And then we have, of course, a very interesting target, and that is the abeta uh, protein. I told you already that this abeta protein is uh, elevated in Alzheimer's disease, it is aggregated, and there are a lot of therapies, actually, that are directed against this so-called amyloid 
cascade. And for instance, here we can, uh, we can here, uh, have the, uh, the secretase inhibitors, uh, the beta and gamma secretase inhibitors, uh, or the modulators of uh, uh, the secretases, and also, of course, um, a, a beta aggregation inhibitors. And these um, secretases are at the moment already in clinical trials. And I think we have to wait to see what is the outcome, but it looks not bad, I would say. And, uh, but the most important treatment is actually, and the most promising treatment is actually uh, the antibody-based um, treatment. Because the idea is that a better um, amyloid protein gets, <clears throat> gets uh, d d eliminated by antibodies, either by active immunization or by passive immunization, vaccination. And, there, and the, the large companies jumped onto this, you know, for some years already, and now tr um, um, trying to find the, some of these antibodies, and <clears throat> and they have um, antibodies, and they also have uh, vaccines already in clinical trials, and we have just now to see uh, what comes out of it, and. Actually, the same philosophy uh, we use here for the uh, anti-tau uh, approaches. Uh, there we want to correct the, <coughs> the pathological functions of the tau, like by inhibiting the phosphorylation, inhibiting the aggregation, lowering the tau protein. And I think but the most important um, um, the therapy there is also the antibody uh, based therapy, where people think and hope that the antibodies will actually degrade uh, the pathological, uh, this toxic tau. And in mice, it, this, these um, experiments were actually very uh, uh, successful. And now we have to wait because also these tau um, antibodies uh, and, and, and also the vaccines are in clinical trials by many companies at the moment. And so I have the feeling there is really hope for therapy through antibodies and a vaccination. We know we vaccinate against all different countries, uh, all give different infections and so on. So it is actually, uh, if it works and it's safe, that would be a great uh, therapy. And there are also some other targets. I just listed here a few. There are much more, and they have all been tested in clinical trials, and they have, all these clinical trials have failed. It doesn't mean that they are not at all beneficial and so on, but they don't help any, any um, uh, memory improvement or so. And these are here, for instance, here, uh, neurotrophic factors and antioxidants and anti-inflammatory drugs or estrogen, uh, estrogen replacement. But there is one other treatment, which I think uh, uh, is not a drug. It is much better than uh, many drugs, and that is a healthy lifestyle. And I think a healthy lifestyle means that you have to uh, take all the efforts to get your cardiovascular system and the metabolism uh, in order because the aging brain is actually um, suffering from, uh, some, from um, sup a decreased decrease supply of nutrients and a decreased supply of oxygens. And so a healthy lifestyle, what does it mean? Uh, you should, or we, or I, we should eat moderately and we should exercise regularly, very, very important, to keep the chol cholesterol down and so on, and then to avoid here uh, diabetes, to avoid, avoid obesity, heart disease, because these are risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. And so my last sentence here is, what's good for your heart is good for your brain. And with that, I would like to thank my collaborators, uh, very engaged technicians, PhD students, um, postdocs and my main collaborator, although he doesn't, didn't want us, uh, me to put it here, is of course my husband, Eckhard Mandelko. <laughs> and, and I just, I just would like, I would just like to have one more word on the funding situation, and that is that we are very thankful for 
all the financial support we get from the German Center for Neurodegeneration that is here in the Max Planck Institute in Bonn at CISA uh, at the moment, and then, the, uh, of course, the Max Planck Society, and then the MetLife Foundation, and then the uh, Wellcome Trust MRC Foundation, and then the Tau Consortium, and then the Foundation Kur Alzheimer Funds. And I think, th although we get a lot of money, you see this, you know, but I think there is never enough investment for basic research in Alzheimer's disease. And the other day, a young student came, very young actually, uh, making a practicum. He said, oh, I have this great idea. I read all these wonderful papers and so on. I would like to treat uh, mice with a certain drug against inflammation. And inflammation plays a role in Alzheimer's disease. And I said, okay, that's, how much does it cost? And he said, well, I need these mice and so on, and mice are very expensive. And, so, and then he said, well, about 15 to 20,000 euros. And I said, no, we have all, all our money is planned for experiments, so we have to wait till we get new grants in, and then you can do this. But I felt that this was a great idea, and I felt very sorry that we could not just say, get, get the mice, because we still have mice that were actually uh, thought for another experiment, and just let him do this experiment because he's so, so engaged and he's so enthusiastic about it. And with that, I thank you for your attention.
Fantastic! That was really, really wonderful, and we thank uh, we thank them for that beautiful uh, rendition there at the end. And this is the end. Um, this is the end of tonight's program. Um, it's also the end of our Science Meets Music series for this year. We thank you for the support that you've shown for our program. Uh, lots of people giving us positive feedback. You can bet we will be here next season. And we hope to see you as well. Thank you very much. Safe trip home. See you next year. Bye-bye.